super grateful this morning that God only cares about our heart when we praise, not our voice, because I'm lacking this morning. But if you would stand with us, greet the rejected Lord, those who pass by, even averted their gaze from the side. Such was the suffering you bore for us. Led like a lamb, a lamb to the slaughter, you spoke not a word, but chose to be silent, though you did no wrong, nor was deceitfulness found in you. Yet by your wounds our salvation has come.
it in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. of the Lord, it's good to be with the body of Christ, and especially to our, wel- our visitors, I'd like to welcome you here this morning. Thank you for coming. Trust you feel the presence of the Lord and come back and worship with us again another Sunday. If you have your Bibles, I want to uh, turn to First Chronicles chapter 16 this morning. First Chronicles chapter 16.
going to be looking at verses 8 through 36, and really the entirety of this section is a, uh, a praise, it's a, it's a giving of praise from David to the Lord for the ark coming back into Jerusalem. And really the background of this text ended up dealing with, uh, if you read a few chapters prior to this, you see uh, David gaining possession of the ark, moving it into Jerusalem, and right before he writes this uh, hymn of praise, this song of thanks, he describes how this all worked out, and that's found in verses 1 through 7. But I want to pick up in verse 8, I want to read this psalm of praise, and as we read through it, um, put your heart into where this is taking place, how this is happening, and the, the events surrounding this. The excitement of the presence of God coming back, coming into their area, coming into their arena. And, and really, in the Old Testament, the excitement of the Ark of the Covenant, that the physical presence of God on earth, was something that could not be matched. It was an amazing thing. It was an amazing thing to have the presence of God in their presence. And as, as believers today, I'm, I think we miss some of that. We miss some of that excitement and that joy that comes when we're in the presence of God, and mostly because we don't have a physical place that we go to meet with God. There is no Ark of the Covenant. There is no temple that we need to go to. There is no uh, tent or synagogue that we go to to be in His presence. Even here this morning, we aren't in His presence because we're at Nauenberg Mennonite Church. We're in His presence because He is with us always. He's in our hearts he reigns and rules in the believer's life. So as I go through this psalm, I go through this, this song of thanks, I want you to think about your present situation. The fact that Jesus is present here today because you are here today. Think about that as we go through this. Start in verse 8. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in His holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in His strength. Seek His presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that He has done. His miracles and His judgments He uttered. O offspring of Israel, His servant. Children of Jacob, His chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Remember His covenant forever. The word that He commanded for a thousand generations the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. When you were few in number, of little account, and sojourners in it, wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people, he allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their account, saying, Touch not my anointed ones, and do, not, do, not, do my prophets no harm. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For the Lord, for, the, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. And let them say among the nations, The Lord reigns. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For when he comes to judge, he judges the earth. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Say also, save us, O God of our salvation, and gather and deliver us from among the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praised the Lord. Now, I know that's a long and lengthy song that was sung when the ark was brought into the presence of the people in Jerusalem. And I don't expect you saying the same thing as you got ready to come and meet with God today with His people. But is your heart there? 
Are you excited to be in the presence of God this morning? Can you say what verse 36 says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Can you say amen to that? Can you praise Him for that? Let's pray. Father God, it is good to be in Your presence. It is good to be here this morning with Your people. To know that You're here because You have established this place this time and this moment to meet us. God, we're so thankful that we don't have to come to a building to to be in your presence, that we don't have to come to a, a certain place or a certain area or be near a certain object to know that you're near us. We are so thankful, God, that you are living in us that your spirit reigns in our hearts and our lives, that it, it directs us, it guides us, and it shows us how you want to be worshipped. God, this morning as we've come to this place, I just pray that it wouldn't be about this place, that it would be about you. It would be about your goodness. It would be about your mercy. It would be about your grace, about your sovereignty. And God, that we can say from everlasting to everlasting, glory be to God. And we can say amen to that. So God, I just pray today that you would meet us where we're at, minister to us, speak to us, and teach us. Help us to know the things you want us to change. Help us to change the things that you reveal to us. God, most of all, we want to bring you honor and bring you glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, this time I'll call up our... Wonderful, wonderful Savior, who would die on the cross for me, freely shedding his precious lifeblood, that the sinner might be made free. He was nailed to the cross for me. He was nailed to the cross for me. On the cross crucified for me he died. He was nailed to the cross for me. Thus he left his heavenly glory to accomplish his Father's plan. He was born of the Virgin Mary, took upon him the form of man. He was nailed to the cross for me. He was nailed to the cross for me. On the cross crucified for me he died. He was nailed to the cross for me. He was wounded for our transgressions, and he carried our sorrows too. He's the healer of every sickness. This he came to the world to do. He was nailed to the cross for me. He was nailed to the cross for me. On the cross crucified for me he died. He was nailed to the cross for me. So he gave his life for others in redeeming this world from sin. And he's gone to prepare a mansion that at last we may enter in. He was nailed to the cross for me. He was nailed to the cross for me. On the cross crucified for me he died. 
He was nailed to the cross for me. Song number 115. Number 115. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me pure within? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my part in this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Glory, glory, this I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. All my praise for this I bring, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you again, all of us again. What is our purpose? Why are we here? Why does this church exist? And everybody knows, know Jesus and make Jesus known, right? And that's why we're here. That's why this church exists. That's our purpose. That's our mission. That's our goal. That's where we are headed as a ship, as a church, to know Jesus and make Jesus known. Now, we've already talked about a, a couple parts of the ship. All ships have different parts. We've talked about a couple of those parts. Uh, we've talked about relationship. Relationship. We need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you know Jesus. Do you know Jesus? And knowing is more than just having met him. <clears throat> and my mind is going to, uh, I think it's Genesis chapter 16, 17, somewhere in there, where Abram and Sarai had made the decision that uh, Abram should uh, lay with uh, Sarai's uh, maidservant Hagar and have a child that way. 
and uh, everything seems to go well, and then the child is born, and then things don't go well between Sarah and Hagar, and, and Hagar decides to flee. She decides to flee, so she leaves, she takes off, and uh, the Lord finds her, or the Lord meets her at a, at a brook, or at a spring, I guess it's a spring, meets her at a spring. And Hagar says in that passage, I think it's the middle of 16 or maybe chapter 17 of, 17 of Genesis, here is where I met the God who sees me. Here's where I met the God who sees me. This spot right here, I know is a God because he saw me. And I met him there. He saw me and I saw him. In your relationship with Jesus Christ, is there, is there a spot in your mind? Is there a place that you can go? Is there a time that you can go and say, yeah, right, I remember, right, right there. That, that was the time. That, that was the spot. That was the service. That, that was the message. That was whatever. Yeah, I know. I met Jesus. That's where it starts. That's where it starts. But from there to today is your relationship. I got married on October 15th, 1994. There was, a, there was a spot. I can remember that spot. That was fantastic. But there's been a relationship that has gone on since then. How is your relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you know Jesus? Have you met him? That's where it starts. But do you know him? Secondly, we talked about discipleship. Discipleship. We don't just know him, just have a relationship with him. We are disciples. We are followers of his. We walk in obedience to him. We want to learn more of him. We want him to lead us, to guide us, to direct us. We talked a bit about all the opportunities we have as, as, a, as a church, as a ship to do that. All the opportunities that we have for discipleship. They're all great. They're all fantastic. They're to help us to know Jesus and to make Jesus known. They're not, they're not standalone things. They're all integrated as part of where we're headed as a church. Today we're going to talk about another part of the ship, and that is fellowship. Fellowship. I don't know what you think of when you think of fellowship, but probably food, <laughs> fun, friends. Uh, we think of all kinds of things when we think of fellowship. Here's a, a definition that I found of fellowship, and see if this uh, relates with you. Fellowship, the condition or state of being in relationship with others of equal or similar rank, qualifications, position, condition, peers, etc. Being in, in relationship with others who, in a sense, are equal, who are in the same boat. And a simple definition of fellowship would be a group of fellows in a ship. <laughs> a group of fellows in a ship. That is fellowship. Okay? You're all together. You're all headed to the same place. You're all experiencing the same things. You are fellows in a ship. All together in one group. Fellowship. Uh, another definition may be shared participation within community. Shared participation within community. And the Greek word for that actually is koinonia, koinonia, fellowship. And actually, Rosedale Bible College, one of the women's uh, halls, I think, is koinonia hall, fellowship, hall. Fellowship, relationship with each other, fellowship with each other, all of us together in one ship, moving together, fellowship. If you're in Genesis chapter 4, I'd like to read uh, the first 11 verses of this chapter. Genesis chapter 4. Verses 1 through 11. <clears throat> now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that, that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, 
And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. First family. First family. Two brothers. One rises up and kills the other. And the Lord speaks to Cain. Says, Cain, where's your brother? I, I don't know. And he says to the Lord, Am I my brother's keeper? And it's interesting how the Lord responds to him. Am I my brother's keeper? If I were to ask you that question this morning, are you your brother's keeper? How would you respond? What, what, what does that mean to you? Cain's understanding of it was, or at least he tried to get that understanding or tried to get the Lord understanding of, the, of that somehow... You know, am, am I supposed to be a, like a supervisor? Am I supposed to be an overseer? A, am I supposed to just sit back, you know, and just sort of peer in, and because I'm, I'm above, I'm an overseer, I'm, I'm above, and I just sort of look in, and I'm supposed to keep track of my brother, and when he does something wrong, well, then I just, you know, I go after him, or I, you know, scold him, or whatever, but I'm, I'm over here, I'm the overseer, I'm the supervisor, I'm above him, and so he kind of, you know, I just kind of kind of keep an eye on him. Am I really supposed to do that, Cain says? And when the Lord responds to him with what he says to him, it's not that he is to be an overseer. A brother's keeper is not an overseer. A brother's keeper is, in essence, a concerned member of the family. There's a big difference. A concerned member of the family. We're, we're on equal status. We're, we're equal. We're the same. Am I my brother's keeper when it comes to being a concerned member of the family? Yes. Yes. Realizing that we're in this walk of life together. We care about each other. We need to have fellowship with each other. We, we walk together. It's not that one is a supervisor or an overseer and one is underneath that somehow. And they're obligated to them. No, we're, we're together. We fellowship together. We're, we're family. <laughs> we're family. That's how this is supposed to work. And right here in the first family, in the first book of the Bible, the Lord says to them and says to all of us, we need to be family. We need to be our brother's keeper. We need to be concerned about each other in fellowship. Not looking over people, but in fellowship with people. Now we realize that as we try to do that, and as Cain and Abel and, and every family since that has tried to do that, that Sin has a very detrimental effect on fellowship. Very detrimental effect. One, there's a barrier between God and man. Right? As soon as sin, sin entered, there, there was a barrier. A barrier came between God and man. Adam and Eve fellowshiped with God in the garden. They had a type of fellowship. It was an equal fellowship, but there was a fellowship. There was a relationship. That, that was marred. That was broken. That was separated. And ever since then, there's been a barrier between God and man. Sin. Separation in that fellowship. We also see that there are conflicts between men and men, women and women, <laughs> in relationships, right? We don't have perfect fellowship because of sin, right? Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's difficult. That's all part of sin's effect on fellowship. We also see that there is conflict, there is strife, there is competition oftentimes between husbands and wives. And you don't need to raise your hand, but that's the reality of marriage, right? <laughs> sometimes there's competition, sometimes there's strife, sometimes there are just conflicts. And it's part of the adverse effects of sin in our lives. If one sinful human being marries another sinful human being, there's going to be conflict, there's going to be strife. Marriage doesn't fix all of that. <laughs> it doesn't make it all go away. 
It actually uh, increases it, I think, sometimes. Uh, as we try to relate together, as we try to fellowship, have that close relationship. And we'll also see that sin has its effects on fellowships, uh, conflicts in families, and conflicts in churches. Fellowship isn't always what it should be, right? Family relationships are strained. Family relationships are broken. There's a, there's a lack of love, a lack of trust. You know, we, we say that we should follow the golden rule, you know, do unto others as you would that men would do unto you. And oftentimes our mindset is do unto others before they do unto you, right? <laughs> do it to them before they do it to you. Make sure you have the upper hand. Make sure you get ahead because you want to make sure that you come out first. All of these things are, are effects of sin, and it has a great effect on fellowship, how we can get along with each other. That's the reality of life. Now, when that happens and when those things come up, um, I, and I'm guessing probably at least some of you, have a tendency to play the blame game. You ever play the blame game? Play the blame game. Well, there's some things that... that uh, happen sometimes, some things that we think of when it comes to fellowship and why we don't get along and why there's strife and why there's conflict and all that things. And one is we, we go back to the good old days, right? <laughs> we go back to the good old days. You know, it didn't used to be like that. Man, when I was a kid, everybody got along. We just, everybody, families got along, everybody in church got along. There weren't any issues, weren't any problems. Everything was fine. It's just, just recently that that stuff has come up. I mean, you know, we tendency to think about the good old days. The good old days. Even marriages. You know, marriages were better back in the good old days. Just weren't problems, weren't struggles. We just, you didn't hear about that. You know, it's, it's our time, you know, the good old days. I see one person shaking his head back there. He doesn't agree with that. <laughs> Not everything was good in the good old days. Not everything was good in the good old days. All right? Part of that is the second point here, that is social media. Social media. Sometimes we blame that. Oh, it's all it's this social media stuff. All the stuff, you know, uh, Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, YouTube, WhatsApp, Instagram, TikTok, you name it, that's the problem. That, that's the problem. All this stuff, before we didn't have all that stuff, everything was fine, now we got all this stuff, and look at all the, look at all the issues, look at all the problems we have. For the most part, I don't think that those things are the cause of the problem. I think what those things have done is uh, sort of exposed the problems, right? <laughs> Back in the good old days, we didn't have all that stuff, right? Now, if something happens, if there's a conflict, if there's an issue, it could be halfway around the world. In three seconds, you know about it. It comes on the news. It comes on your phone. It comes somewhere. So it's not that there's more of it, and studies would actually show us that. There is not really more conflict in marriages, families, homes, and things today than there was 50 years ago. It's just that now we know about it. Now it's exposed. Now it's out in the open. And so the tendency is we think that there's far more than there was. And, and some things there are to a degree, yes. But it's not like there wasn't any in the good old days, and now we're just full of it. Okay? Social media. <clears throat> Along with that comes desensitization. Desensitization. It's a tricky one. This is a tricky one. We need to be very, very careful about the things that, that we take part in, the, the things that we allow, the, the things that, that we watch. Because Satan would love nothing more than to desensitize us to these issues in fellowship. It happens very subtly. Very subtly. And if you look at uh, studies, if you look at uh, the news at all, it's become increasingly, uh, I'm not sure what word to use, but increasingly apparent that there is a desensitization when it comes to the value of human life. The value of human life. We as, a, we as human beings, we as a race, are becoming more and more desensitized as to the value of human life. And that's in all different areas. All different areas. Not just the unborn, but living people as well. People's lives, in many cases, to some other people, have no value. Have no value whatsoever. 
And it's become an increasingly uh, sort of a, a, I'm not sure what word to use, but, a, but it's sort of a, a, a movement toward in, intentionally harming others just for fun. Just for laughs, just for a kick. Just, just do something that intentionally harms someone or even causes them to lose their life and then laugh about it. <laughs> That's not funny. It's all part of desensitization, the blame game. We're at a point in history where animals and even plants sometimes have more rights than human beings do. And it's all because we've been desensitized to the value of human life. It has a great effect on our fellowship with each other. And then another one is the, the individualism, the indifference, the apathy, the, the self-indulgence. Um, our lives are to express ourselves. To express ourselves. It's all about us. What I want, what I like, what I desire. And if that's our mindset, fellowship doesn't really play into that. <laughs> If I want what I want, and I want to do what I want, and I enjoy what I want, and you want something else, it's hard to have fellowship with you. (laughs) You need to think like I do. You need to be like me. You need to do what I want to do. And when we have such a mindset of individualism, and it it is rampant in our society today, it's it's a barrier to fellowship. It's hard to have fellowship like that. All of these things are effects of sin, and all of these things affect fellowship. But let's not play the blame game. So fellowship. <clears throat> what is fellowship? Well, fellowship, uh, overarching, I guess, definition would be a concern for the welfare of others. And that's what Jesus taught. That's what the scriptures teach, an over, uh, overarching concern for the welfare of others. And if you go into the Old Testament, you'll see that there are actually specific laws that were in the Old Testament for certain groups of people to make sure that people were concerned about their welfare. All right? There were laws about how to treat the poor, how to care for them. There were laws about how to treat and care for widows. There were laws about how to treat and care for the aged and the orphans. There were specific laws for those groups of people to care, to be concerned about their welfare, because God was concerned about that. If you look at the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments, the first three are man's relationship with God. Man's relationship with God. Have no other gods before me. Don't make any graven images. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. First three. The fourth one is about the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's four. The other six are all all about relationship between people. Concern for other people and how to treat other people and how not to treat other people. Five, honor your father and mother. Six, do not murder. Seven, do not commit adultery. Eight, do not steal. Nine, do not give false testimony against your neighbor. Ten, do not covet your neighbor's dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Six out of the ten, 60% of the Ten Commandments are about our relationship with others, caring for the welfare, having concern for other people. And then if you come into the New Testament, the teachings of Jesus go above and beyond all of that yet. And we're going to look at a number of them, the teachings of Jesus and the apostles. And you don't need to turn to these. You can if you want. I'm going to go through them kind of quickly. But Jesus had a lot to say, and the apostles had a lot to say about being concerned about loving, about caring for other people and one another, having fellowship. All right? John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. John 13, verses 34 and 35. Jesus speaking. <clears throat> a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And this is the only place where, where Jesus shares that he has a new commandment. In essence, he's going above and beyond what their understanding was. And their understanding was that you loved your friends, you loved your neighbors, and you hated your enemies. You, you hated those that, that didn't agree with you. They were sort of outside. Jesus said, no, <laughs> a new commandment. You love, and you love, and you love. Fellowship. You care. You're concerned about the welfare of others. Matthew chapter 22, 34 to 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? 
Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Fellowship, love, be concerned about the welfare of your neighbor. If you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9, the Apostle Paul speaks to this. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Have a concern, have a care for one another. 1 Peter chapter 1, 22. Peter, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Love fervently. Truly, really care. Be concerned about each other. Be concerned about fellowshipping with each other. It's important. And even John, 1 John <clears throat> chapter 3, verse 23. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment. <clears throat> love one another. Fellowship. Be, be concerned. Care about each other. It's important. <clears throat> so how then do we live? How do we live in fellowship, living in fellowship? A couple points here. One, recognizing that we are part of the whole body of Christ. We're part of a body. We're, we're one member, but we're part of a body. There's something bigger, okay? Something bigger. We're all on this ship together. I'm just one little part. <laughs> but we're all together. I'm part of a body part of what uh, the body of Nomberg Mennonite Church. And, and every person deserves respect and therefore love. Every person. Show love to others while maintaining faith in Jesus Christ in his word. Okay, doesn't love and respect while maintaining faith in Jesus Christ and his word. Secondly, sharing in love. Fellowship, sharing in love. Share with each other. Share our gifts share our talents, and even share our weaknesses. It's a little harder to do. Share our weaknesses. Understanding that our weaknesses may be someone else's strength. And so we can fellowship. We can encourage each other. And sometimes our strength is someone else's weakness, and we can fellowship. And we can build each other up. And we can be encouraged. Sharing our strength, sharing our weaknesses within the body of Christ, within the community, the community is, is built up because of that. Society is built up when we do that. Learning that our weaknesses could be another strengths and our strengths could be another's weaknesses. And we can help each other as we fellowship together. And thirdly, caring in love. Caring in love. Personal involvement. Do I care? Do I care? If we're going to have true fellowship, then we truly need to care. Do I truly care for others? Personal involvement, it, it creates a, a net of support, a net of encouragement. We had uh, the privilege, it's been a number of years ago, I don't remember how many years ago it was, but uh, we had a privilege as a family, our kids were young, pastor's conference was out in Arizona, so we actually flew out to California, it was cheaper to fly there than it was to Arizona, we rented a vehicle, we uh, saw the redwoods and a couple other things there in California. And one of the things we saw was the Golden Gate Bridge. We actually walked on the Golden Gate Bridge. That was amazing. That was fascinating. A uh, piece of, of, of architecture, the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, it was built in the 1930s, the Golden Gate Bridge. Started in, I think, 1932, somewhere in there, and finished in 1937, 38, I believe. Um, the projected cost uh, of the bridge was $35 million. Now, that's a lot of money. It was a lot more money back then. Well, that was the projected cost, and that's about what it ended up being built for, I believe. Now, what you may not know is that at that point in history, <clears throat> when bridges and other you know, things that were built that were way up in the air like that, the sort of accepted norm within the industry was that you would have one fatality for about every million dollars that the project cost. 
So if you were doing a $5 million project, that was kind of a small project, you could expect to lose probably five men, and that was kind of acceptable. That's sort of the, just the way it was. If you had a $20 million project, it was a bigger project, a longer project, you would probably lose about 20 men, and that was just kind of normal. That just happened. That's the way it was. It was a dangerous business. The Golden Gate Bridge was expected to cost about $35 million, but only 11 men lost their lives during the building. Because the supervisor, the one who was in charge, cared about his men cared about the workers. And he put in place a, a whole group of safety measures that, that had never, you know, they had safety measures back then, but he was adamant that his men would follow them, and if they did not follow them, he fired them. He fired them. If they didn't follow the safety measures, they were gone. He didn't want anybody out there, you know, doing things that they shouldn't be doing. He cared for them so much that he said, if you don't follow the guidelines, you're fired. You might not like it, but at least you'll be alive. Okay? <laughs> he cared about them. He had them wear special hard hats, special hard hats that would help with you know, any kind of falls or any you know, rocks that would hit them. They, they were special hard hats designed especially for that work. He had those that were riveters wear respirator masks. The rivets at that time contained lead in them. He didn't want them breathing that in, so he made them wear respirators, those that were riveting the steel together. Had to wear respirator masks. He provided glare-free goggles for all of those that were out there working. Because of the sun shining and because of the water below, the glare oftentimes would cause them to lose their balance. He didn't want that to happen. Had to wear the glare-free goggles. He also provided them with a special hand and face cream that they had to put on that would protect them from the sun and from the wind. Had to wear that. But one of the greatest things that he did was to put up a safety net. Put a safety net underneath the bridge as they were building it that spanned across. And that was about 10 feet wider on both sides than where the men were working up above. So that if anybody fell, the net would catch them. There were 19 men who fell and who were caught by the net. 19. There were 11 who actually perished. There are 19 more who would have had it not been for the net. He cared. He cared. Living in fellowship, caring for one another is providing a net. <laughs> it's providing a net. Do we have a net? Do we care about each other? Are we, are we concerned about each other that we're there to provide that net? <clears throat> when people are going through struggles, they're going through challenges, they're going through difficulties, hey, we got you. We got you. That's fellowship. That's fellowship. That's part of it. Very, very important. It saves people. It helps people. It keeps people. Fellowship. <clears throat> what are the ingredients? What all goes into fellowship? There's a number of words I'm going to share with you, and we'll think about these as I close here this morning. Fellowship. What does it mean to be in fellowship? What are the ingredients that go into that? How can we you know, make that happen if it's not happening? Well, one is appreciation. <laughs> Expressing appreciation for each other. Recognizing and enjoying the good qualities of others. When was the last time you patted somebody on the back? That, hey, good job. Hey, I appreciate that. Hey, thank you for doing that. You know, we sometimes have the idea if we do that too much, people's heads are going to get big. Well, I don't see any big heads out there this morning. <laughs> they all could be a little bit bigger, and that would be fine. So let's do more of that. Hey, I appreciate that. Hey, thank you. Thank you for teaching Sunday school. Hey, thank you for watching the kids. Hey, thank you for, you know, working with the youth. You know, let, let's appreciate each other. That's part of fellowship. Part of fellowship. Another one is confidence, expressing confidence in each other. Having a trust, having a belief, having faith in each other. Do we always think the best of each other? Do we think good of each other? Do we, do we trust each other? Or when it comes to, to relationships or it comes to working on committees or whatever that might be, well, I don't know if I trust them. I don't, you know. No. Let, fellowship. Have confidence in each other. Trust in each other. All right? Friendship. 
Friendship is part of fellowship. Having a, a mutual trust and support. Do you, do you like each other? <laughs> do you like the other people on the ship? Or are you, are you on a ship with a bunch of people that you don't really like? That's a problem. <laughs> That's a problem. If you're on a ship headed to a destination and you don't like anybody else on the ship, that can make for a very long journey. Do we like each other? Do we like to spend time together? Do we like to do things together? Do we, do we just simply like each other? That's part of fellowship. Part of fellowship. Love. Love. Standing in for one another. We are committed to each other. And the, the, the story came to mind. I was looking for it and I could not find it. I uh, searched for it for quite a while uh, last night. But uh, the story of uh, one, of the, one of the prisoners of a prisoner of war camp was talking about how they were put into this room and each morning the guards would come in and whoever was closest to the door, they would drag him out and beat him till he was just about dead and then stuff him back in the door. Next morning, same thing would happen. That same guy was sitting right by the door and they dragged him out again and beat him till he was just about dead and chucked him back in the door. And I think it was the third or the fourth time that that happened, the rest of the prisoners in there realized that if this happens once or twice more, he's going to die. So they changed positions. Somebody else sat by the door. So the next morning when the guards came in, they grabbed the first person by the door. It was somebody new. They dragged him out and beat him until he was almost dead and chucked him back in the door. Sometime during the day, they switched again. They all took their turn. Because they loved each other. Standing in for one another. Are we committed? Do we care? Do we love? It's part of fellowship. That's true fellowship. Patience. Patience, a willingness to endure situations and endure, uh, you know, crisis or whatever without giving in to anger or giving up hope. Without giving in to anger or giving up hope. We know that because of sin that's in our lives, all of these relationships, this fellowship is not always going to work perfectly. <laughs> it's just not. We need to have patience if we're going to have fellowship. There are some times we just simply need to be patient. Patient with others. To endure situations without giving in to anger and without giving up hope, but this will never change. It will never be different. No. Have patience. Temperance. Temperance, having self-control, having moderation, having restraint, that needs to be part of our being if we're going to fellowship with other people. We can't just fly off the handle. We can't just you know, make our thing have to happen. You know, we need to practice this as well if we're going to have fellowship. Another one is tolerance. And before you jump on me about that word, okay, tolerance, think of it in, in, in this light. We need to have a willingness to work with others on the same ship realizing that we don't all have the same views and the same opinions about some things. And that's okay. There are things that we do need to agree on. Pastor Greg has talked about this, some of those, you know, number one, first right-hand things. We have to agree on those because this is where we're headed as a ship. And if you don't want to be in the ship, if you don't want to go there, then that's kind of a major problem. But there's some other things, for example, like what, what color do we paint the ship? <laughs> what color is the sail? How big of a motor do we have? You know, those are things that we can talk about. We may not all agree on, but we can still work together. So we need to tolerate some of those things. Maybe you don't like the color of the benches. Maybe you don't like the color of the carpet. Maybe you don't like the color of your Sunday school room. Oh, well, you know, can, can you tolerate that? Is, is that okay? Can, can we still work together? Okay. Needs to be a little bit of tolerance. Another one is trust. <clears throat> trust. Believe in the reliability, believe in the ability, believe in the strength of others. Have a sense of trust with each other. If we're going to fellowship, we need to trust. There has to be a level of trust. If we don't trust others, we're not going to have true fellowship. We're always suspicious. We're always guarded. Hard to have fellowship. Detriment to that. And the last one, and probably the biggest one of all, I know it's the biggest one, and that is forgiveness. 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 Recognizing that each one of us are sinful human beings. And sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes we get it wrong. 
We need to be willing to ask others for forgiveness. Say, hey, I was wrong. Hey, that was a wrong attitude. Hey, that was a wrong perception. Hey, that was a wrong whatever. Will you forgive me? That's big in fellowship. <clears throat> we also need to be willing to forgive others in that as well. Because sometimes we, when we sin against others, or always when we sin against others, we damage that fellowship. We, we, we hinder that fellowship. And if we're not willing to forgive, we're not willing to grant forgiveness, we're not willing to ask for forgiveness, we'll never have, we'll never have fellowship. Never have fellowship. Whether it's by our wrong attitudes, our wrong habits, or our wrong desires, we need to be willing to ask for forgiveness, and we need to be willing to grant forgiveness. All of these things are ingredients that go in to fellowship. Again, Nomberg Mennonite Church, we're here to know Jesus and make Jesus known. We do that through a relationship with Jesus Christ, not just having met him, but walking with him, having a relationship with him, being a disciple of his, a follower of his. And part of that as well, as we move along as a ship of Nomberg Mennonite Church, is to have fellowship. Fellowship with each other. As equal members of the family, brothers and sisters in Christ, we're a group of fellows in a ship, together, headed in the same direction. Fellowship. Fellowship. Let's pray, shall we? Father, this morning, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the ways that you have spoken to us here today. And Father, we just uh, thank you that your word is living and active and it's powerful. God, I recognize this morning that, that you have called us as a church to know Jesus and to make Jesus known. And Lord, that's the cry of our hearts. That's, that's the desire of us as a church. It always has been and it, and it is moving forward. God, help us to realize how important relationship is, first of all, with you. And, and discipleship, discipling, and taking part in those things that, that are provided by the congregation, provided by the church, that, that we can grow and, and learn more of you. But especially this morning, Father, thank you for the opportunity to realize anew and afresh how important fellowship is. How important it is to truly care for each other, to, to walk with each other as, as members of the family, to realize that, yes, we are our brother's keeper, and it's because we care about each other. It's not because we want to be over anybody or supervise anybody, but we truly care. We're on the same level. We, we truly care about each other. We want to encourage and we want to help. Help us, Lord, in that fellowship as well as a congregation to, to be that safety net that is so important to catch people, to encourage people, to guard people out of a heart of love. So again, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us here today. May you receive all the honor and the glory. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> I just want to draw your attention.